Peter Griffin, good morning to you. Morning, Catherine. Uh, it is the topic du jour in many ways. What uh, the Prime Minister is setting offshore to attempt to do in Paris with the French President, which she has kept fairly confined to let's get murder off the main platforms. That'd be nice. Yes, it would. Uh, Others are suggesting this is a moment in time to think about wider regulation of social media platforms. What's being um, revealed in this new Law Foundation report? Yeah, very good report that's come out. This is a year of work. I think they actually... Uh, expedited the release of it because it's just so topical at the moment with the Prime Minister heading off to to Paris next week. And what they're doing in this report um, is looking more broadly at the fundamental issues. What caused uh, that massacre to be broadcast to thousands of people on Facebook, live-streamed? And and the reason behind that is the live-stream system exists to engage people on the Facebook platform for longer so that they can show more adverts to them. That's fundamentally what, what's, what it's about. And that's why Mark Zuckerberg has so far resisted calls to, to, to suspend that service because it, it's good for business. So the, the, the three big issues that they've really identified in this report are the fundamental problems. The fact that these are platform monopolies. We have two or three companies that have the attention of three billion people around the world. So a huge concentration of power there. The way they've designed their systems um, is borderline unethical. It's designed to keep us in this what they call this attention economy, to keep us clicking, swiping, scrolling, to stay in that environment so we're exposed to ads for longer. And the third problem is there's just no transparency into the, the computer algorithms that underpin these systems. What what you see in the news feed or in your Twitter feed or in Google search results is dependent on a whole series of algorithms that very smart people in Silicon Valley have come up with. We have no idea what is in that black box that is worth billions and billions of dollars to Facebook, Google, Twitter, and others. That's a problem. We know some of it from the likes of the former YouTube engineer we spoke to, that the fundamental approach of the algorithms there yeah. is to program the machine, whatever will keep this individual looking the longest do. Mm-hmm. And what the machine learned was the do was the most divisive, the most extreme content right. of whatever subject matter would keep them looking the longest. So it's simplistic, mm. but th- th- there's your model. Yeah. And and I, what... I don't know about you, if you just, and I don't do a lot of YouTube, but when I do find out, um, do do a bit and it's therefore at the top of my feed, um, it goes Radically extreme on whatever. I mean, you could be doing flower arranging, you know, um, very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah. That's one. That's, that's one example. So yeah. these are the three problems that we probably are aware of. Mm-hmm. Then what? So, so then they're looking at. So, what? What is the solution to to these problems? And th- these are not common to New Zealand. This is happening all over the world. Everyone is struggling with them. And the problem really is a mixture, according to these researchers, of smart regulation and human responses. And if you look at the regulation, effectively these companies have been very um, low regulation. There hasn't been very much regulation. No kidding. Yeah, (laughs) enforced on them. Um, So the researchers are saying, well, you know, if you, if you, it's how you treat these companies. If you treated these companies as media companies or as utilities, they would be treated very differently legally. And other laws that apply to power companies and newspapers would apply to them. And this is something that Mark Zuckerberg has really resisted in the US. He he does not want Facebook to be treated as a media company because suddenly you, you start looking at antitrust around media power. And if we look in this country, what happened when the Commerce Commission said, you know, the Herald, NZ, me and stuff weren't allowed to merge. I mean, if you look at the power that Facebook has to influence opinion in New Zealand, you know, surely the antitrust is a possibility there. So there's that stuff on the antitrust front. There's more regulation potentially around data privacy, around actual real teeth in our um, legislation, penalties around um, inability to police hate speech. And we've seen the Australians do that very hastily in the the wake of Christchurch. They introduced big fines and prosecutions for the executives who let the stuff spread. So there's lots of stuff on the regulatory front we can do. The problem is we don't know what the implications of that will be. Well, can we do it? I'm still waiting for the day that an Australian court puts a um, Facebook executive in prison in Australia, and I'm not holding my breath. 
The challenge to all of this is that these companies operate across borders. Mm -hmm. This is why the problems are becoming so evident to us. There is no geographic or sovereign border around which you can control information flows. So how are you going to, I mean, are you going to stop New Zealanders accessing Facebook or accessing YouTube or accessing Twitter? And if not, are you going to have a series of prosecutions? Germany has introduced a 50 million euro fine. Yeah, yeah. But that is a, a cappuccino in the morning <laughs> to the profits of these companies. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm, I, I totally think you can you, you can hit them in the pocket, which is where it hurts, with with fines, and we should be doing that like the Australians Can we make them doing. pay, by the way? Yeah, I think we can make them pay. Or we can say... We're shutting down your business in New Zealand, so you know. No government is going to shut down their business in New Zealand. Why not? <laughs> because there would be a revolt by voters who use their products. Well, there, yeah, there's a lot of utility in Facebook, so hopefully it wouldn't come to that. But look at the European Union have imposed big fines already on the likes of off Google and, and others for anti-competitive behaviour for breaches of privacy. We've got these GDPR, this um, general data protection regulation that's been introduced. Big fines there. So I think it is possible to to do that but ultimately you know i you know facebook has put aside 5 billion us dollars in its latest financial uh, accounts just to pay fines in the us alone and the share price hardly took a hit at all so that it would have to be serious fines and and tough implementation of them to actually make a difference on that front the other side of it is that the researchers talk about is the human response and this is where it gets a little bit i think a little bit flaky not that they haven't done a good job, but it's just harder to, to do anything. They talk about about tech workers themselves in Silicon Valley standing up to their employers and saying, we're, we're not going to design unethical products. We um, are drawing the line at this sort of like a unionism type movement emerging in Silicon Valley. And we have seen a bit of this. We have seen engineers at Amazon and Google start to push back, particularly around things like facial recognition and artificial intelligence. But is it enough because these are quite well-paid people, for them to bite the hand that feeds in a way that will you know, open up the transparency around these algorithms. Or as our former YouTube engineer found when he said, I'm going to continue research on designing algorithms that don't push people towards ever extreme content and material, he got sacked. Yeah. There's plenty more queuing up for the job. Yeah. Is it recommending then that New Zealand undertakes some kind of regulatory approach or that we join in... An international effort, and there is a growing international effort. You mentioned Australia, mm -hmm. Canada is looking at this, Germany's already moved, the wider EU is looking at it, the UK is looking at it. Uh, you can start to get, if you exclude the United States, um, under the current administration anyway, a yeah. democratic, uh, some of the democratic contenders have talked about quite drastic measures. You can start to get a reasonable <clears throat> critical mass built up, even among countries that are concerned right now. So are they more advocating that we become party to some kind of a push there or that we just do things off our own bat? Yeah, I think, I think they're saying that, um, that the more players are involved in this, the, the better. There are things we can do now. And there are niches they talk about where New Zealand could play a leading role in influencing policy that is implemented around the world, the treatment of indigenous material and, and information and the digitization of that, for instance, is one area they've talked about. But ultimately, um, the, the best way to treat this is sort of our government's approach to the taxation issue, which is a whole different kettle of fish around the fact that our tech companies, um, the big ones operating here, aren't paying much tax locally. They're shipping those profits to lower tax jurisdictions. So the government, because it was just needed to do something, has said, well, we're going to apply a digital tax to them of 2 or 3%. But that probably won't roll out before the OECD come out with their tax reform to, to treat digital companies. So it's much more powerful when you have 36 or 40 countries saying we're going to apply the same laws to, to these tech companies. The, the EU really are the shining beacon, I think, in the world of being proactive on this front. So if we can align with them, with other countries as well, that would be the best approach. It feels like a rather large elephant, and you're biting it, I don't know, the toenails at, at, at this um, stage in mm. some ways, because it is not just as simple as do this or we will cut off your services to our citizens. That's yeah. simply not going to happen. So you are left wondering about what is enforceable and what is not enforceable. We did seem to buy this BS that somehow 
Um, you know, and it began with the internet. I'm so annoyed about the way we find ourselves criticising the internet, whereas, in fact, you're right. It is essentially four or five companies who have eaten the internet and perverted it essentially to their own benefit. Yeah. Um, but this idea that it would be different, it wouldn't need regulation because it was all about freedom of speech and it was all about everyone having a voice and everything else, which is lovely and sort of where the idea started. Mm-hmm. It has become completely the corporate plaything as every other um, you know, profit-making endeavour has become <laughs> yeah. in, in many parts of the world. And we bought it. You know, If we can control the airspace mm-hmm. of the world and the millions <laughs> of flights that happen every day... exactly. And control that by cooperation, um, by regulation within country and between countries on an international basis. We already have a model of where to avert disaster. We can quite heavily and successfully regulate activity. Uh, yeah, totally but, agree. But yeah. somehow this has always been seen as different. You know, you yeah. mentioned utilities. And, yeah. Um, in some ways, if they don't want to be publishers, then maybe they are utilities. They're providing the equivalent of the fibre optic cable, you know. It's, e- uh, it's arguably equally be, as pick, important. Pick yeah. one or pick the other. Yeah. But we're over listening to the idea that you're unregulatable and, and that you oughtn't be. We're yeah. over it. Yeah, I think we are over it. And Zuckerberg himself has said, look, we, we, we need more regulation here. He sees that this is inevitable. But you know, when, when your, preview, your book reviewer was talking about these Silicon Valley values that he still aspires to, and it was very evident, in the last week, both Google and Facebook has, have had their big conferences in the last week. F8's the big Facebook one. And he made a joke on stage. He said, you know, we, we haven't got a great reputation for privacy. It went down like a, a, a lead balloon, as it should have. He still thinks in his mind that the utility that Facebook provides to those 2.3 billion people around the world is far, far, far greater than any of the harm that is caused on that platform. And that's his utopian dream to connect the world. And now he's pivoting to, to privacy, so he's going to encrypt, finally, yeah, that, Facebook Messenger. But, and that, but that that has its flip side as exactly. well, because now it becomes more difficult for anyone else to see what yeah. is happening. I, they're, they're different problems. The mainstreaming of extreme behavior has come so into the spotlight this year. So the idea mm-hmm. that this was this dark web and most of us didn't know how to get there and most of us wouldn't want to go there and there was certainly no way it was going to pop up in your kid's YouTube feed on the third clip. Exactly. You know, now we've realized that is a problem. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that locking off behaviors beyond the scrutiny of others is necessarily the solution either. No. It's damn convenient for Facebook because it can go hands off again. Yeah. Well, it's not us. Nothing's with us. We just provide the platform. Yeah, and that's what the pivot is about. Okay, if you guys want privacy, we'll give it to you, but you're not going to be able to see all the bad stuff that goes on. So, and fundamentally, you know, the, the, these researchers are saying we need to go back to the root cause of this, and it is the stuff that's harder to tackle. Like, you know, what is freedom of speech? What is hate speech? And and this filter bubble that these algorithms create that foster that environment where someone gets radicalized. That's at the heart of it. One of the problems is I don't think there is a single regulator or lawmaker in the United States, actually, in particular, who has any idea. I mean, we haven't even got near what AI is happening in Silicon Valley at the moment. Completely under under no oversight and under no kind of regulatory um, restriction. And they just don't know. I, I don't pretend to understand it, but I'm not elected to the Senate or the House of yeah. Representatives was responsibility for understanding Yeah, and if you look at the rhetoric from, from Trump, it's not just that he doesn't understand it. Whenever this issue comes up, it immediately pivots to a conversation about... Um, Fake news? Uh, yeah, and limiting the influence of conservatives. On, so it's just total Look, self-interest on his part. That's yeah. all he's interested well, in. Well, you have to get the self-interest out of it. Yeah. This is the point. This is why we have institutions. This is why we have regulations, because by nature, human beings are self-interested, mm. some very so. And this is the check and balance we have on our freedoms and our initiatives and our, innovative, mm. uh, our innovations, is that, hang on a minute, when this affects other people, other people get to have a say. Yeah. But this particular sector, because we all drank the Kool-Aid and out of magical thinking thought it would be some kind of mm. human nirvana, um, you know, and, and bless dear old, who was the founder of the internet? Um, I was just going to say Tim, Tim Cook's uh, wrong. Uh, Tim, Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee. Yeah. 
I don't doubt their motivation and their yeah. vision, yeah. but unfortunately the rest of us piled on and brought all our behaviours with us. Yeah. Yeah. So it's this moment, I think, certainly in this country, but actually before now, it's been this moment for some time where we've realised something's got to be done, but there's just no one really in a position to make the move with a motivation to make the move. Yeah, it's been building, so uh, it's great that it's culminated, in, I think, in hopefully in some action um you know the g7 thing in paris there'll be some big names there supporting jacinda ardern but um ultimately it's going to it's going to have to hit them in in the pocket and you know all the researchers in this report you know the interviews they did the technical people said it is technically possible to fix this there are systems better content moderation systems that will uh tackle some of these issues but it's going to cost those tech companies a lot of money and for facebook last year 22 billion dollars in earnings up 39 percent on the previous year they're a listed company they're beholden to their shareholders and they're going we don't want to cut into that by 10 or 20 percent a year i do understand the approach in paris to keeping things very focused and limited or otherwise nothing yeah. will happen yeah absolutely. and that makes a lot of sense and still nothing may happen but and hello. wouldn't it be nice if zuckerberg turned up <laughs> I, i'm not holding my breath yeah uh, quick hit on device of the week. Mm. What's the story with this um, Apple Watch? Yep. Yeah. So great, you know, great device. Um, I, I, I've got a different one, an Android one. So I, I like smart watches. But how long should you expect to get out of a, a smart watch? They're coming out thick and fast every year. There's a new one coming out. Um, well, uh, Apple suggests maybe three years of usage is enough. Um, a, a particular um, a customer who bought an Apple Watch thinks maybe five to six years is suitable, and the disputes tribunal has agreed with that. They're saying that three years isn't enough. The software updates should be able to extend the lifespan off that watch for five to six years, and I agree with that. How long has it been? How long was the, what, what, what? How long were they sort of... Well, they're basically saying in the fine print, you know, so for, we, we will support regular updates, ongoing updates for this watch for... Um, for for three years, three years. Or, or, or so. And what's the cost price? I mean, these, these cost six hundred fifty seven hundred dollars. These are the high end devices, and there's a lot of great technology in them there. But uh, you know, smartphones you you're still using an iPhone six um, five years on. So why shouldn't you use the smartwatch as well? Um, particularly at a time when you know th- this this whole built in obsolescence, where we're we're really forced into this upgrade path every. It used to be every one year, but now they're so expensive, these high-end smartphones, that it's people are holding on to them for longer. And that's to be encouraged. We should, in sustainability terms, be holding on to our devices. They should be built to last longer. Five to six years, I think, is reasonable. So it's great that this sets a precedent now where if, if people have other devices who go, hey, after three years, the functionality of this is very much degraded because I can't get software updates. I think there's a good case to be made there. I hate to mention regulation again because I'm not the regulation queen at all. I mean, I'd, I'd love there to be no need for it, but mm. unfortunately it keeps popping up. There is a country that's actually required, it's some kind of appliance um, required the, that it's it's able to be repaired. It was something like a fridge or a, yeah. you know, because that's driving you nuts too, isn't it? You know, you've, your grandmother's got the washing machine that's still rattling around after 50 years yeah. and yours, yours lasts about three years yeah. or seven years, to be fair, six or seven years. Um, it's just been the sneaky little, you know, and, and this was simply make it reparable, make it have parts that can be taken out and for $2 replaced. Yeah, try and getting it had a, to be legislated for. Try getting a flat screen TV um, uh, repaired in, in New Zealand unless it's a very superficial thing, a new panel or something like that. It's just not worth it. So Still got my problem. Nokia, Peter. It's 1G, but never mind. Great phone. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Peter Griffin.